Can I begin? Yeah. Can we start? Are we okay? ready? Right. Still look like some people are still not here. Should we wait? Yeah, we'll start. We'll start uh. Okay, uh, so welcome guys to my turn now. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, testing in PHP. Uh, I'll be covering a whole bunch of different topics, uh, but before I continue on, just like to say this is my first time doing something like this. So if there's like, I, I made a mistake somewhere, I apologize. If it's too boring, I apologize. It's, you know, I apologize for whatever. <laughs> so uh, first uh, about myself, my name is uh, Hanif Norman. I'm a senior software engineer at 2359 Media. Uh, basically dealing with uh, mobile apps a lot, Some, sometimes uh, web apps, but mostly mobile apps. Uh, truth be told, actually, I haven't worked in, on PHP in like almost a year now. Mostly everything is in Node.js now on our company. But I do have the occasional uh, PHP maintenance projects. So uh, that's my credentials. <laughs> right, so let's, uh, let's talk about testing. I think one of the, one of the big biggest, uh, most common things I hear from develop the developers that have not started testing yet or have some sort of uh, testing protocol is that they say that they don't have time to test, uh, that they they rather be working on more features, they rather be work, working on fixing bugs or working on de deployment issues and things like that, rather than testing. But uh, the fact of the matter is most of those things that they talked about working on could have been avoided if they had tests. Uh, a study done uh, a few years back by Microsoft and IBM states that had this found out that uh, implementing a testing uh, protocol increases time spent by a, uh, a between 14 to 35 percent. So time spent on on work increased by about 14 to 35 percent, but bugs are reduced by anywhere from 40 up to 90 percent. So if you guys can just think about that, how much time you've spent working on fixing bugs that appeared after you wrote your code. Then you know, just imagine that 40 to 90% of that disappears because you, you spend an extra 35% uh, of your time to work on tests. So I don't know about you guys, but for myself, my personal experience, that actually in the long run uh, is a positive gain where I end up actually saving time from testing too much, uh, or rather from debugging too much. So let's define a few things first. So when I say testing, uh, what exactly do I mean? Uh, first up is, it's, I'm talking about automated testing, right? So I'm not talking about like your QA guy goes through your app physically and then writes down, smashes his head on the keyboard for random input, that kind of thing. So this has to be automated and automated is good because you reduce uh, user errors, right? Uh, user input errors, user errors and things. And, and because of that, it's repeatable. You can repeat the exact same task again and again and again. So if it fails, you know it's that exact set of input that's causing the problem, that exact set of scenarios. And if you can't figure it out, you can write out more scenarios, uh, more different test inputs, and it, it's, it will be there and it will be repeatable and it will be persistent. Uh, what I mean by persistence is that, that that test will always be there after you write it. I mean, if you proper, if you follow proper like uh, coding standards with, with a repository and things like that, it would always be there. So that's regression, protection for, uh, from regression. You def if, if you encounter a new bug, uh, if you encounter a bug rather, you can be pretty sure that it's new, it's not something you've encountered bef before because all your tests passed before that, all your current tests passed, and it's, that test could have been written from the beginning of your project a few months ago up till now. And it will accumulate, and basically, the, as more time, uh, as time goes on, it will tend to, I mean, if you follow the principles properly, you, you tend to build up on your coverage, and basically, uh, it's your safety margin, so to speak. So, uh, white test, again, uh, reduces bugs, obviously. Uh, tests are also really good documentation. If you write tests well, your, well, your tests are well designed, it has descriptive names uh, which, which tells you uh, what you're testing, for under what conditions and things like that, it's really good documentation to show the behavior of your code. Uh, 
what this specific code does, what this set of code does, what can you expect it to do, what it shouldn't do, that kind of thing. Uh, especially under like the new like BDD, you know, behavior-driven development, it's it's even more so. Uh, it also allows for refactoring of old code. So legacy code that is messy and ugly and really is a pain to, to work on and debug. If you have time to just write a set of tests to cover all this, what all of what it currently does, you will be more confident to refactor because you can just change something and then run the test again, then change something else and then run the test again. As long as those set of tests pass, you know that it still works as expected, no matter what you do to the code. So it adds a layer of confidence uh, to what you do. It reduces cost of change. Uh, cost of change is basically uh, related to refactoring. Wherein, if you want to change something, as long as you have that test, you, you know that it will still work, right? You want to change, uh, like how you implement, a, you want to change like to a different third party package. Like say you don't want to use MySQL anymore, you want to move on to MongoDB. Right? If you test it out properly uh, for your model layers or your database layers, and you just do the switch, and then you can just test again, and then we see fix whichever parts that are that are broken by that change, and you can just be confident that it's still working. And it also reduces like unexpected uh, issues that might pop up. Of course, this is under the condition that you write good tests. Yeah. And then there's also increases confidence in your code. Uh, so this actually is. Uh, downplayed a lot by people if, if they don't experience it. Uh, increased confidence in your code means, uh, generally speaking, you tend to make better decisions and you tend to lead, your thinking leads to better design. Uh, in and of itself, tests can also lead, to lead you to think to better design. Uh, because you know you have to test something, you usually have to make sure that it's not coupled to anything, and that leads to like decoupling, uh, it leads to like single responsibility, all that jazz. So let's talk about the, uh, the different type of tests that we, we talk about automated testing. So first up would be uh, unit testing, which is does it work by itself, which is you break up your code into like the smallest units possible and then you test that small unit. Usually that means it's a function or a method. Right. Then integration testing, that does it work together? If you have a code here that, that will call another piece of code somewhere, if those two, even if they work in well independently, would they still work well when they are together and dependent? Right? So, uh, I mean, in the more practical terms, uh, maybe you want to have the, your model talk with your database. So that's integration, right? Your two different subsystems that are communicating together. You have to make sure that those work. And then there's acceptance testing, also known as uh, functional testing. User acceptance test, right? So this is basically where you, it's a basically an end-to-end -end test of your product, of your application, uh, from a, the user's perspective. So if you write uh, your specifications, as in like user stories, that's, that's really popular now in Agile, right? You have to make sure that you acceptance test basically covers that, that it fits all the scenarios that described in the user story. So first up, uh, let's go into more detail with unit testing. Uh, the mid of your testing suite, right? Most of your code will be probably be uh, PHP, uh, sorry, in unit tests, where you test all the small parts of your codes individually in isolation without depending on anything else. So this test in isolation is important because you don't want to test something else. When you say you test method A when, it's, when you're receiving input B, it should only test method A when it's receiving input B. It shouldn't be dependent on anything else. On if, if you have anything other that's dependent on maybe a separate class that it needs to generate uh, some sort of data based on input A, it should be mocked. So not dependent on that. So you should only test that. And uh, basically ensures that that function works as intended. And this is, uh, unit test is going to be the number one way of avoiding regression when I say like persistence, uh, where tests are persistent and it continues, basically it stays there. So most of that is going to be in unit testing. Because like integration testing, sometimes you change different way. Uh, if you change 
if you change your, your database structure, usually you have to change your integration test. But most of the nitty-gritty functions that does the logic the, uh, will usually tend to stay the same. So this avoids regression. Any test that covers a bug you found previously will always still be there. And then when you do a change or add a new feature, you know that those bugs won't appear again, or at least not in the condition that it originally appeared. And uh, encourages uh, good design. Like uh, I mentioned previously, because you test in isolation, you have to design your classes and your functions to work in isolation in some way or another. So uh, I'm not sure how many of you were around for last week's, uh, Michael Brees last week's talk on dependency injection. So he did the test with you, right? So that's basically uh, one of the advantages of uh, dependency injection. It makes tests easier to do this, but it also means if you do depend on dependency injections uh, in your classes, uh, it's also a good design. You decouple your class from the, the, the dependencies. So it is not a hard coupling wherein your, that class itself will be, will be calling the constructor and initializing that, that dependencies. You, you depend on something else. So when you test, you can just pass in a mocked instance of that uh, dependency. Then we'll move on to integration testing. So like I said before, integration testing is basically uh, test the interoperation of subsystems. One part with another part usually, sometimes even like a, a function that will call a different functions. Uh, that will also count as integration testing, so although that's, uh, some people would argue it doesn't. Uh, most of the time it's going to be, in terms of MVC applications in JavaScript, it's going to be like testing your controller. If you test your controller, that's generally going to be an integration testing because controllers depends uh, on a lot of things like uh, uh, HTTP requests, HTTP response, database, layers, and things like that. So clever, like an API test also will be an integration test. Uh, basically, confirms expected behavior. So if you do something like, uh, like BDD, which I'll talk about later, where you specify behavior, uh, most of the time you're going to initially write out uh, integration tests or user acceptance tests, but integration tests are more popular. So you test out uh, all the different layers of your, of your application together, uh, your presentation layer, your business logic layer, and your data layer together. Uh, and this also is a good way to ensure that your code works with third-party uh, libraries or packages, right? So like, again, uh, database is the, the big example. Like you have a the PHP uh, MySQL package to make sure that it works. You use an ORM uh, from you extend from uh, a third-party package. You test it out with the database itself. That's an integration test to make sure that everything works as expected. Then we will talk about acceptance tests, uh, also known as functional tests or user acceptance tests, UATs. So it's basically done from the point of view of the user. If the user goes to this page, clicks on this link, uh, he should go to this other page, right? So that's a, that's a user acceptance test. So uh, it make sure that it meets users' expectation. Uh, specifically, usually, you're talking about your client or your customers. That if you sp specify like, the requirements for this, or they have specified the requirements, this is usually where you do automated testing to meet those requirements. So there's all kinds of really cool uh, tools you can use for this. For example, like Selenium uh, Web Driver, where you can basically emulate uh, a browser, and then you, emulate a click on an element on the web page and things like that, in, input of forms and stuff like this. So you can automate this, although on, uh, on mobile it's a bit, a bit tricky. Yeah, integration of all the elements from user interface to database. And uh, it's usually the last step, uh, when I mean last step means before uh, deployment, before like going live, so to speak. <coughs> so, now we move on to test-driven development. So this is something that came out within what, the past decade or so, where it becomes really popular now. Uh, and and you know I believe the hype, right? Uh, I think it's important to follow this, uh, basically because I've also experienced this myself and experienced how it it, ha it has helped uh, my development process. So what is TDD? 
test first uh, software development methodology. So, uh, how many of you know what exactly this means? What? Right. You write your test first, then you write your code. Right. So, technically. Yeah, but you think about the functionality whenever you write code anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, but it does change how you think about design. Mm, it's, it's harder. Uh, at first, yeah. But it, it takes some practice, but after a while, you get a hang of it. Uh, so it's basically, the key thing here is the iterations. Like, you can see the... the wow, well, you can't see it. Okay, never mind. So the, it's, it's basically the red part there. It says uh, uh, test, write test, and then uh, test fails, test passes refactor, then test fails, test factor, passes, refactor. So it's a cycle, right? You, you go through this uh, short iterations of writing tests, writing code, and then refactor. So you write the test first, and you will fail because you haven't, write, you haven't written the code. Then you write the, the code, the implementation, until the test pass, and then you refactor. So uh, refactoring is basically, you know, make it look nicer, re remove like repeat repeated code, that kind of thing. And then you write another test, or you maybe expand on the test you've already written. Uh, so in terms of uh, I was, what I've spoken to before, the requirements can also be, uh, can be a test. Right? So if your requirements for a certain piece of software is to make sure that all input is n are numbers, then you can also write that as a test. So that's a... Uh, one of the things that most people do when they start uh, TDD is they write the requirements as a test. Right? So requirement A, this test here, you write it down, and then you write the code. And then usually sometimes you have to write smaller tests than that because your code, you know, you don't usually just write one function for one uh, requirement, right? So the, no, that's supposed to be TDD, but never mind. Uh, so the three rules of TDD. So uh, you are not allowed to write any production code if there is not a failing test to warrant it. Basically, it means always have a test first before you write a code. So technically speaking, in TDD, this is pretty much the only rule, the only hard rule. But I've added two more because I think it's a good idea. Right, so yeah, the second one is you are not allowed to write more of a unit test than is strictly necessary to make it fail. That means write the simplest test you can to make it fail. So for, some, for a function, when you start out with a for a function that doesn't exist yet, that pretty much just means calling your function, right? And then assert whether it's true or not. It will immediately fail because it doesn't exist yet. So that's simple, simple, uh, simplified. And then you're not allow, allowed to write more production code than is strictly necessary to make the failing test pass. So again, write the most simple code you can to make that test pass. So since that's the original test basically just checks whether it exists or not, just writing a basic function uh, will already make that test pass. And then you ref go on to the next step, which is refactor. Usually by the first step, nothing much to refactor. So then you move on to make the code more workable, right? Well, so let's, let's try that out, shall we? So in short, it just has the person focusing on the outcomes that are expected when they're writing the code. Because if you, if you write the test first, mm -hmm. the test is you know the expected outcome. You're, you're yes. Testing, you're testing for the outcome. Yes. So it's, it's actually you're, you're thinking about the outcome. Yeah, because usually when, when, when you start on a project or you start on a feature, you pretty much know you have the expected outcome, right? And then you have figured out what inputs you need then that's usually when you write the functions, right? So this basically just codifies it, puts it into like, you know, puts it on paper, so to speak, so that you, you can run a qu uh, quick test on it. So uh, can anybody, can everybody see this? Duck. Yeah, let's, let's switch the... I actually don't use Atom. <laughs> I'm only using it for this presentation. <laughs> eh? 
So let's no this is the wrong thing. Let's okay. Let's do this. So can everybody see right now? It's clear, right? Okay, so let's let's do do a TDD exercise. So I have a I have a, a class here that I set up. Very simple class. It's supposed to be an implementation of a set. Uh, the set data structure. Uh, if you don't know what a set is, it's basically like an array, but there's no indices. There's no index, that means there's no sorting. Right, so we're gonna do this with uh, TDD style. We're gonna build this TDD style. Uh, so on the left here, on the right, sorry, on the right is going to be our test that I've already set up. So I'm using uh, codeception for the test, uh, which I will go into a bit more later. And this is the class we need. So let's think about a set. What will be the first? What what would we do we need for a set? What would we what are the properties we need? What are the methods we need uh, for a set? But then? Are there like an is empty, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's let's start with that. So first we write a test, right? So uh, in PHP unit, which which codeception is built on, uh, it will only run test uh, functions that begins with the word test. So that's a that's a key thing here. So you can't just write uh, whatever. It has to. It has to start with a test. Then is empty return true. Okay. So that's that's the test. So as you can see, it's it's a very long function name, but. Uh, Generally speaking, you want to keep your, your function names uh, only as long as necessary. But in tests, forget that. Be as descriptive as you can. For a test, be as descriptive as you can. I, you, I would usually, uh, for like any other uh, like language other than PHP, I would actually prefer like underscores between the, the words because it's easier to read. But it doesn't work with codeception. Codeception screws up the formatting if I do that that way. So I'm just going to do it. Uh, Camel case like this, snake case like this, right? So test is empty, all right. So and then, I'm sorry. Now there is PSA two Rodinstein now. I I don't. To mention the the Rodinstein of the HP one. The tool is it? Yeah, PSA two. Hmm. It's called PSA two. Oh, 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 yeah. That's the that's the the coding standard for oh, yeah. for like styles, right? Was it like a, a, a formatting style, yeah. right? So like, uh, if you what he's talking about is the PSR two coding uh, coding standard. So if you look at how I how I do the class declarations and functions, so like the the curly brackets is on a new line, that kind of thing is and. The indentations are always four spaces, no tabs allowed, that kind of thing. So it's actually a pretty standard thing that's actually covered in the PHP the right way website if you've seen it through. So uh, it's, it's actually a good idea to follow because most packages that you get from Composer that you download will be, generally speaking, uh, following that format. All right, so let's initiate a new set. Then we just do an assertion. This true. No, this is this. <laughs> empty. All right, do that. Then so for for, for codeception, we're just going to run. Set run unit, and we're going to run the test. <coughs> and it fails, right? As expected. So now we can 
implement that function. So is empty, right? Is that a, a method or a property? Pardon? Method is better. Method is better, but it only it's only going to be Boolean, right? It's either going to be true or false. Yeah. Right? Right. Okay, for enough what? Let's keep things simple for now. Getter and setter, even if it's not the. Getter and setter? Yeah, it's something, it is a getter of a Boolean program here. But even if it's here, probably it's not necessary, but. Uh, can we can use like a, a magic method to to return also? Then we just call it is empty. It's also possible, right? But for now, uh, I wanna keep it simple, right? Because remember, right? Only as much code as you need to make the test pass. So the simplest implementation right now is just a property, right? Come on. Wow, I can see. Right. So let's just go do. Public is empty, right? And you know the simplest line of code we can write to make it pass is simply mm -hmm. this, right? And then we run, run it. I don't know why it's so slow. Usually faster than this, but right? Okay, look, it it pass set test. Ignore the user test. This is just the set test down there. So it passes, right? So now we refactor. So what can we refactor? Nothing much. It's, it's just we have only written like maybe three lines of code, right? So that's not really that, that much to refactor. Uh, but let's, let's keep it at that. That works for now. Uh, so what, what's the next thing that we need for a, a set? Uh, set class, a set data structure. What's the next thing that we would need? Mm, how about an add add method, right? You want to add an element to to a set, right? So let's let's do that, right? So get once again. I can't, I can't hear what you're saying. Which one? Which one? Adding an element. Uh -huh. Then uh, testing is empty. Add uh, add an element, then test is empty. Right. Actually, that's that should be what we need to test, right? Uh, so add an element into set okay so we do set equals to new set then let's say set at uh, one then how will we confirm how will we confirm that it has been added Maybe we need something else to confirm that it's been added. Yeah, let's go with that one. So, yeah. this. So, two. Right. And. Then. And of course, as expected, it, yeah. it would fail. Uh, yeah. it, eventually. No? <laughs> Oops, sorry. I'm, kind of surprised it didn't. I'm surprised it didn't too. Wait. I save now. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I didn't yeah. save. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's just 
Right, okay, so <coughs> now we know that fails. So let's add the add method, right? So public add Right, so now add. So where exactly are we going to store all this all this data? What's a good way to store all this new data that we're adding? Sure, why not? An array. So uh, since uh, I'm, I don't want people to be able to access it, I'm just going to set it as a as private. Right, so it's going to be an array. Value. This data equals. Menu, right? And then, uh, what do we need to make it pass? This empty false, false. right? Yeah. Now we do that. I'm sorry. Well. Oh, I write public function. Sorry, too much JavaScript. JavaScript don't have public. Pardon? JavaScript don't have public. Yeah, but JavaScript also don't have to add function also. What? Now that passes. So now refactoring. What can we refactor from here? <coughs> like uh, what we what we a good change. That's why I the what? I wanted isomt <coughs> to be a method, so isomt uh, to check if. Uh, Data is empty or not. Which one? <coughs> is empty? Yes. Yeah. So you want a way to check whether it's empty? I've seen the, the, the data array. Yeah. Why not? Then we have, uh, we have one line. Let's uh, hmm? set aside to four. Mm -hmm. You know, aside to not. Not empty? Yeah, explain to not empty this data. Right. So yeah. to, check, to check the data property yeah. is actually empty instead of passing hard code to four. Right. Data is empty, yeah, actually. Actually that would work too. Yes. Let's do that. No, don't do that. So That's no a good way to. I'm sorry. No spray after explanation. Okay, that's a good one. Anything else that we we can do? Or is this or is this good enough for an add add uh, function for now? I'm sorry. What? Now you have to remove the uh, the command command set, right? Ah, uh, yeah. 
Right. No explanation. The bank is not there. Yeah. Okay. No explanation. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. The new bank bank is one. Then, does it does that work in PHP? Does that work in PHP? Yeah, I know. I know it works in JavaScript. I don't know whether that works in PHP. <coughs> What do you guys think? It's okay, or should we move on to a different to add a new implement a new method? View the data, right? So like a like a get, right? Like a, a get method to get that data, right? Okay, so let's start with a test. Returns data if not empty. Oh no, maybe if exists. So I think will be a better one, right? Right? Sorry? Return an element. An element. Uh, an element. Uh, return. Mm, yeah, sure. Okay, so this new set. Let's do set at one. <laughs> this equals no, you're not. Run the test. And of course, it fails. Right. So now let's implement the get method. So now, how will we get that value from data? Well, we just pull it on AL. I'm sorry? We just pull it on AL. <laughs> the if I'm in array. <laughs> well, then? If in array. If in array? And then we don't need it. Yeah, because actually, the simplest code to make this pass, right, is simply this right <laughs> this is the simplest code to make it pass yet yeah? no but the thing is like if the value is not exist inside the data mm -hmm. we should read the yeah. yeah yeah but think about the interface of the set what do you want to do is what do you want to use the set for yeah what do you use the set for we don't have set here we have only have n no, no, set the, the class, the data structure set. What what would you what would you think it is for? What's what's useful about a set? Uh, there's, there's okay. The set has stuff to it, but it's only one instance of that the thing you have to do. You can't have more than one thing. Like every time you add something to it, there's only one instance of that. Like yeah. a string, for example. A string so that says cute. There's only one instance of the word cute. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, how do you find, so like say, what is the behavior of a set? A set is, you add things to it, you will increase in length. Like, when, when once you try to add something that's already there, the length doesn't increase. Doesn't increase right? Because it's already in there. Yeah. Yeah. So, what is the more, what is, well, do you want to get things back from the set? Do you want the, the unique stuff that you need in the set, right? I don't know. <laughs> 
Who created the classes? The what? Who created the classes? I did. And why? What? <laughs> this is an example of TDD. Anyway. Well, anyway, you're, you're looking to see if it exists, right? So yeah. what do you do if, like, if, it's, if it's empty or something uh, is set? So it, it, data value is set? If, you know yeah. So that something needs to change, right, if that's the case? Something needs to change if that's the case, right? Yeah. Like, so we need to, one way of, uh, of doing that is probably to just run through that, ar that array and look for, for this. Exactly. Or like, uh, like Michael, the other Michael says, in array, right? Yeah, in array. Yes. No, no, no. We are getting. We are getting. Oh, you okay? Right. Get. We are getting that right now. So. Hmm? is the value first then the array is it? Yeah, right, so that pass so now time for refactoring. So uh, Michael pointed out a good point, right? So if it doesn't exist, what should we return? Because right now, if it doesn't exist, we return nothing. True Pardon? True exception. True exception? <laughs> okay. True exception. So else? Don't else. Oh yeah, because we already have a return. <coughs> Pro new <laughs> What? What? Okay. Exception not your No error. JavaScript. <laughs> Is there a namespace for exception? As a Okay. So now we have that. The what? You wrote the code for, uh, before uh, watching the test. Yeah, that's true. I did that wrong, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, this is just uh, to show an example of how uh, TDD would work, right? So you write the test and then you write the function. So it takes more time, yeah. It, it, it's more, there's more effort you need to put into when writing, but as you can see, as I write this, all my, my stupid mistakes all were discovered pretty early on the moment we, I run that, that the PHP, the CodeSap run unit, right? Yeah. So it, it is, while it takes more effort, it is better in the long run, because what happens if I write that whole class, then all that stupid mistakes that I did, you know, my confusion with JavaScript, uh, errors and exceptions and all this, all stayed there and then I run the code, 
And then after that, I have to find, find you no, know, have look through the error stack, and then have to find back the code, and then fix it again, and then maybe run it again. Don't know to whatever test I did before I discovered unit tests, right? So it, you avoid a lot of that in the long run, and there's also the added uh, assurance that this set of tests will always be there, right? For this, in this uh, test suite. It will always stay there as I find more things, as I, as, I, as I make more stupid mistakes, right? I can just add more tests to cover it up for it so that, you know, the next person who works on this class, you know, they won't make the stupid mistake or, or else the, the, the test will start failing. So it's, it's, a, it's an assurance kind of thing also. And uh, I'm not sure whether you guys, um, this is a good example or not for you guys to, to understand that you kind of change the way you think when about writing a new class and new methods when you uh, write a test first. Right, so like I think like somebody points out, you write the specification, you literally write a, a very hard specification for your functions first, and then you write the test to make sure the specification pass. Yeah. Right, so uh, like I said, I'm not entirely sure how obvious it is. Uh, if, you, if you have it's any... It's all outcome driven. Yes, it's, yeah. It's all outcome driven. You're, 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 you have a very specific outcome in your mind. You write the test for that specific outcome, yep. then you write the yep. So it's, uh, I also need to uh, make it a point to just say that how iterative it is. You have to keep going back and forth like that, right? So eventually, I will, uh, like say if I want to get an, uh, create an exist class, does uh, is exist or something, right? Class in there, uh, function in there, I, pr I will probably have to change, uh, probably have to like, you know, move out the, that I will probably move out that in array check to its own thing. So because I don't want to call in array, uh, twice in the same class or something like that. So exist will be just in array and then I go like this exists. So those those are iterative changes, right? And then you can do those iterative changes because that test is still there. So even if I change in array and then move it out to its own function called exist and then use this exists in the get function, as long as that test pass, I'm fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's an iterative process as you go along, as you build up and as you refactor. Uh, yet. Hold on. Okay. So that's that's uh, my brief introduction to uh, TDD. So next, I'll cover. I'll talk about behavior-driven development. So this is even newer than than TDD. Yeah. And also getting quite popular. Right. So what, what exactly is BDD? Behavior driven development, in case you weren't paying attention. Just behavior. Yeah, behavior. Just driving my development. Right. So it's, uh, practically speaking, it is the same, essentially the same as TDD. You still have that iterative process of uh, test first, test pass, refactor, test fail, test pass, refactor, that kind of thing. So that, that iteration is still there. The difference is, uh, tests uh, defined uh, by behavior instead of functionality. Right? So instead of saying for like our earlier example that uh, is, empty, is empty returns uh, true when you when is it, when just is it instantiated, you write uh, is empty uh, where, sorry, uh, set when <coughs> instantiated with uh, when it's actually with no value, is empty returns true, right? So it's a very, very specific, uh, not spe not say specific, but more like plain English kind of a description for each test. So you describe it, it provides like a, a good template for for behavior of functions and uh, and your application as a whole. Right? So you're, you're describing the desired outcome, which, how you want to behave. Yes. And then the, the key part here is you usually assign a scenario to it, right? Like when this is this and this is this, then this should be this, right? So you, you assign a, a, a whole scenario to your test. Right? For example, like on the, on the side here, this is uh, what is known as story BDD, right? So it's a very specific way of writing specifications uh, for your for your tests, right? So it, this is popularized by I think uh, Cucumber for Ruby, right? Is that for Ruby? Uh, Cucumber. So this format has a name. It's called Gherkin. Gherkin. Yeah, because Cucumber. Yeah. Right. So as you can see, features that you this 
this uh, basically describes your features. Then this, those are the rules. And then the scenario is what you are actually testing. So when, when you write a test, so for example, like uh, for, for Cucumber and for, I think for PHP, that's Behat. Uh, what you will be specifying is actually, uh, well, all of those, but your test will actually be described, will be establishing the scenario, right? So this is, this is story BDD, but uh, unfortunately, I can't go much into story BDD because I don't, I don't use it that much. I'm, I'm, I'm more used to the other kind of uh, BDD, which is spec BDD. Okay, so this is the, the scenario that I was uh, giving to you. So in spec BDD, it isn't so, uh, how would you describe that? Not so wordy, not so verbose, right? Uh, for as, as story BDD, because story BDD, that's, that you have that exact format, you have to keep that format, you have to specify the rules, you have to specify the, the user role and things like that, right? But for spec, uh, BDD, it's something like this. So this could be the scenario for an integration test, right? Because just from just from the description, you can tell it's going to involve more than just one function, right? So given the user has an item in the shopping cart, uh, and that item costs fifty dollars, when the user clicks purchase, then the user should be charged fifty dollars on his credit card. So all that is is very integration testing, right? You're going to combine together a lot of different elements and get that. But it's a very nice way to specify requirements. And then if you remember earlier, I talked about how it's good documentation, right? With BDD and BDD frameworks, you, are, you can write down your test like this. And when you write, when the test output will also be uh, somewhat similar format. And what's good about that is that non-technical people can also see that and know that the, this requirement is met, like your uh, like non-technical project managers or maybe your uh, stakeholders or your clients. They can you can run the test or they can run the test themselves and see that all these scenarios that are built up uh, is passing, and it's very easy for them to understand a scenario like this. Right. A, so for another example. Uh, this is, let's say, for a unit test also can be done in BDD style. So for unit test, it's like, for example, the set uh, class that I created. So given class set, uh, when instantiated with no values, then property is empty, should return true, right? So this is uh, the spec BDD way of specifying a unit test, right? And again, even for somebody who's not so technical, right? Not a programmer, maybe just a, a, a top level QA guy, then you can see this, you can somewhat get what you're trying to do and you can really understand uh, what you're trying to achieve. And then you can also see that I've highlighted the, 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 the words there in green. So those are, I would call keywords. Uh, it's, it's not a must that you have to use this, but it's a really good idea to keep to the BDD standard that's been established. I think this was established with uh, R, R spec, right? R spec uh, on Rails, so Rails, uh, Rails establish a lot of these things. Then PHP tries to catch up, I guess. <laughs> uh, so this is BDD style scenarios and testing, right? So TDD versus BDD, not really mutually exclusive. Actually, it's pretty much interchangeable for most frameworks that are available today for testing is really how you name the, the test functions, right? And then there are some, some uh, frameworks that gives you a, a bit more leeway in how you want to describe your test, right? But generally speaking, the main difference is really just how you specify the, your function names. Because that's, that's the, the key thing here is that's how you describe it. And then I've mentioned before the, that the main advantage for this is easier to understand. Even for technical people like developers like us, if we see something that's easy to understand, uh, if like say you picked up on a project that your friends, uh, your team member did, and he writes his tests in BDD style, it's very easy for you to just pick up on what exactly he's trying to test and what is exactly should be the outcome. Right, and thinking in behavioral terms can cover for TDD's uh, shortcomings. Uh, this requires a bit more explanation, I think. 
uh, TDD's shortcoming is not really a shortcoming. It's more of the person who runs the test that's the shortcoming, which is the 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 mindset of functionality versus versus behavior. It's hard for me to to explain it uh, properly in words. Uh, basically, it's when you think of e- e- behavior, you tend to be a lot more uh, all all encompassing, right? High higher level uh, perspective of your applications, even when you do unit tests. It's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of BDD tests ten, tends to start with integration tests instead of like how we, we do uh, unit tests usually for like TDD typically. BDD people usually tend to start with an integration test, uh, very similar to how I show you the, the first scenario example, where given this scenario, this should be the outcome overall, right? So if you look at the, uh, the, the diagram there on the side, so we start with, with BD, I, sorry, I've, I chose a black color background for some reason. Uh, BDD on the left hand side there is where you write the feature. So that's an integration test. You usually write the integration test for like a feature set, like the shopping cart feature set first. You write the, the, that scenario for integration first, and then as you start working on that feature, you start building up on the unit test, which is the TDD part, but still technically BDD because you'll be using BDD style language. Right, so it's, it's pretty much interchangeable. There's, there's not much uh, work you have to put into it to go from TDD to BDD. Yeah. You only test for code that is directly revoked by the feature. So you go at feature level, each feature might have different six different or five different scenarios of it, uh, using the same feature, right? Yep. You write five or six of those right. scenarios. Yep. Right? And they all invoke this first layer top level of code. Yep. Whatever it calls below, you don't care. But you check the results. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's that's yeah, so that's why I say yeah. so you start with that, that, that first integration test first. Yeah. But I still recommend that we do the unit test first, but in BDD style. It's, 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 that's why I, I highly recommend that if you want to start now, do BDD. Because writing that first integration test right is really, really helpful. It really eases up a lot of things. Because even if you're too lazy, like you, you, you pick up somewhere, you had, a, you had a very long day, you had five meetings in the morning for some reason, and then you have to sit down on your computer and then you have to finish up this feature, right? You're probably going to be really lazy to write those new unit tests, right? But as long as you have first write that integration test, right, you're covered. Because it will behave as expected, right, no matter what you do. So a lot of frameworks now will help with that. Uh, like, uh, like PHP spec now, there, there is Codeception also have, have, function, uh, have, have something called Specify, I think. Uh, the new package Specify that can help you write things like this. The yeah. problem with the integration tester is Stakeholder change a lot of functionality change often. So you you have to yeah. I mean that's that's the downside of integration tests, right? But I, that that initial test. So good practice is you start that integration test and then you as you work on it, you start building up the the set of unit tests, right? So that's good practice. So in the end, if you have to change the integration test, the unit test will still pass, and as long as the unit test still pass, we can slowly change until the integration test pass again, correct? Right. So that's, that's the, the best case scenario. But uh, as long as you have the integration test, you can be uh, more than reasonably confident that your code will work. Right. So it's, it's better than nothing, and I, I think it's, it's a lot easier, especially for we have a work with teammates that are quite res- you know, they don't really want to do this, right? You, you keep, you tell them about BDD and they're like, eh, I, okay, right. They don't really want, want to do it. So it's just tell them, okay, just do this thing first, build it up, and then you, you can work from there. Then you can work on your build test. Because uh, integration test does have some setup costs, right? Because especially if, you are, you're, if that feature requests to a database, then usually that means you have to set up the, de- the test database with yeah. some test data in there. Right, so there's usually a bit of upfront cost for integration tests. 
Yeah, so you do that first, get that out of the way, and then you build up. And then after that, start building up your, your unit test, which is much, much simpler and more straightforward. And uh, BDD can run a spec level, so it can be like 20 times, 20 times faster than your Selenium integration test. There's no like browser to fire up, there's no... Yeah, but Selenium, I would I would put Selenium under uh, acceptance test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Right, right, right. Because that's more useful. So yeah, integration right. test for me is, even if I just test a model that 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 integrates with the database, that's yeah. integration test. I see. Right. So for if you, if you want to put the, the, the front end into it with Selenium and everything on the back end, that's more of a user acceptance test. Because Selenium is a, this, uh, like, it's like a fake browser that you can control. The user. Uh, it's a driver, driver, right? Yeah, yeah. You can you can click you can emulate clicking on elements of your of your front end with it, uh, but that's beyond the scope of this. I'm afraid. Actually, actually, I wanted to, but my doctor committed suicide. So now I don't know. Maybe later Michael can help. Your what? <laughs> my my doctor uh, committed I'm not suicide. Your no. <laughs> No, that's you're going a bit too dark there, man. Right. So uh, now I want to talk about uh, conception. Actually, I've prepared like a whole example project for this, but like I said, my Docker stopped working. Right. Okay, and uh, and I couldn't get it up in time for this presentation. So I'm just gonna uh, show you some stuff, I guess. So if you've seen earlier that how how I write how I write the test, uh, I was using uh, codeception to write my test. Yeah, sure. Mm. You sit down. Is it okay? Yeah. So I run uh, I I use codeception. It's my preferred uh, testing framework for PHP at least. But uh, as you can see, uh, it automatically. I don't know how many of you have used PHP unit. Right, you use PHP unit. What what's the test output? It's just dot 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 dot, dot. and then you have to like you have to yeah like, So you have to specify the output type and all this. Right. So for code set, right, is by default this is the output. Right. You will give the the test the the test suite class and then the the function name and you will switch the camel case into like an actual sentence. So that's why I, I type it out really long, all the function names, because uh, code set will just turn it into like a proper sentence like that. We just separate it all out with spaces in between. Right? So code section is good just not because of this, right? Just, if it's just this then you know I can live with with, with PHP unit also. Uh, but it's the good thing about code is it does unit testing, it does integration testing and it also does acceptance testing. It has built-in support for for Selenium web driver. It has uh, you can get package modules for Laravel, Symfony, Zen framework, uh, and we work with all of those uh, different popular frameworks. And even for like the less popular ones, uh, I don't know what Slim, right? It, it will work too, just with a bit of work with the bootstrap files to make sure you load all the required files properly, right? And it's also really easy to to set up uh, a new test. Right? For example, when I created the test for that set user, I basically just go went uh, mm. Mm. Never mind. Right, so it's vendor being put set generate test unit then I give the, the the class name which is you have to specify the class name which is the the full uh, package name right, so just now it was I set up as uh, app ut utilities set Right. But I've already created this, so it's going to come out of an error. So let's let's test something else. Uh, let's test user, the user class here. No? No. Yeah. 
So, oh, I already created that test too. Okay, never mind. So uh, you can generate tests with just uh, command lines like that. So there's different types of tests. So you, you see that uh, I type out generate test unit. So code session comes with different types of uh, test suites, so to speak. So there's test, which is just now you sh uh, we use for the test, uh, for the set testing also, which is an ex basically an extension of PHP unit. So specifically for unit testing. But they also have the SEP type, which is for acceptance testing. And it's, it's a lot more uh, convoluted to set up, but you can write really nice code. Uh, let me show you the... Too big. No, no. Hmm? Okay. Right. So. Look here, this is how you would write like an acceptance test okay. in code set, right? Once you write, once you generate the test file, it's basically, you're going to use like how you would describe yourself as the, as the user, or rather the test itself will describe itself as a user. So I equals, I equals new functional tester scenario, blah, blah. So then what they provide is language that is quite intuitive. So for example, they have this one I am on page, then you specify the root, the root that you want to go to. Then I click, which is login. So what they will do is they will look for the word login and then it will, they will click on it. So that means if there's a login that's not a button, it will try to click on it and nothing will happen. So, but the good thing is there's this click function. You can specify this login as a CSS selector style. So that means you can do like uh, if it has an ID, a CSS ID on it, a style sheet ID on it, you can just do like hash, then login or the ID name of whatever. Then you will go to that element and then perform the click. Right. And the same thing with the fill field uh, function too. It will also, you can also specify the, the field you want with, with CSS selectors. And then so the first part is the the element you're looking for, and then that second parameter is the value you want to fill it up with. Right? And then you click enter, and then I see hello mouse. So it will look for uh, the H1 element with the words hello miles in that specifically, it will look for that. So if it sees that, then the test pass, passes. And then there's also a special functions for example like that you can see at the bottom there is a that's a special function for symphony 2 framework where you can see you will hook into the uh, mailer uh, mailer class then we'll check whether you have sent the mail to it All right so this is uh, an acceptance test that you can specify very specifically right and you can specify also for it to run this using selenium web driver so when you run this test using with the Selenium module uh, enabled, you will actually see like this browser open up in the background and then it will start to traverse through automatically and it's really weird at first when you see it, but it's, but it's, it's really cool also, also, right? Because automatically you'll just run through all the elements of your, of your website and run the test. And then it sees, it will look for, for this H1 element and then it will see this. So the, this C functions also accepts uh, CSS selector uh, styles for the elements that you're looking for. So basically just look to make sure that this element exists and it has this text inside it. You can also specify uh, other HTML tags inside inside this instead of it, it doesn't have to just be it doesn't just have to be like this string it can be another HTML element inside that should be in there like maybe an alert like bootstrap style alert in the class element inside. You can also specify it that way. So this way, you can specify a whole range of acceptance testings. So uh, if you're wondering just now why I said I don't use story VDD, it's because CodeSap has this, right? And it's, it's very easy because uh, my job also is mostly mobile. So on the occasional 
stuff that I have to do, uh, like a web front end, I'll just use uh, a Selenium based tester instead of, like, say, uh, Story BDD. Because, uh, well, to be honest, I'm not really familiar with, with like Cucumber and Gherkin. <laughs> so, this is why I like. So, then another thing that, that Codeception has is uh, really good extensions. All right, so first up is this one is no no this is the wrong one, sorry this is specify so this is one that i only discovered quite recently actually just a, just a few weeks ago and so far i have i, have, I, I like it can we see <laughs> right so compare this to the Oh, crap. No, no, stop. Right. So compare this to the earlier test that we have done before. So we have test validation, right? Then assert that model is instance, or this user is a of model. Then you look at, after that, it's specify, username is required, then function, then verify, specify, then verify. So. Does this look familiar? Right, so, if you if you, if you don't don't see it, yeah, this is basically BDD style language, right? I think so. We can basically do given validation, right? For model, uh, the user model, that you can specify username is required. So, like I said, the the should uh, the all those those green letter highlights are like when and should. And those are uh, good standards, but it's not a must, right? So how I would write this is probably specify uh, user should return username is required, right? So I can specify also above that as when username uh, when user is empty then validate username is required. So you can you can do this all in just this one thing here, one function that test validation. So that means you can test different scenarios in one function because previously. Yeah, previously you have to specify different tests for that. And uh, it's not that it's annoying or anything like that, but it doesn't make logical sense when it's all testing for the same thing, just different scenarios, right? Yeah. So we specify, uh, you can do this. You have one test that that's basically just says validation, which is to test validation. And then you specify the different uh, behaviors that you're expecting from it. Is it? Yeah. It's parallelized, it's a test for it should no 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 uh, if, if this fails right if this fails the rest still con will still continue for tests because right uh, yeah so one of the reason uh, why you testing yes test yes yes uh, yeah so uh, that won't happen even though it, it will you will initially run it as like a normal PHP unit test up front here. When specify is called, right, is it, you notice it's actually a callback function, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So even if this verify here fails, right, the rest would still be called because it's all as, as part of a callback inside this main test. So it will still work as expected, like any any sort of like testing framework that you have. Yeah. So uh, this. Conception uh, um, had a mistake to. Uh, to specify a uh, verify a function, a uh, global function. Uh, uh, yeah. Not, uh, but this is just an example, yeah. anyway, so it's not. Uh, yeah, well, you had a question? Because we've been writing all these test cases in one function, right? Mm -hmm. Using provider. I'm sorry? Provider. Providers? Yeah. PHP Unit has a provider to provide all the data to feed into the test. Yeah, but that's. Uh, you can do that, right? But there's actually not that much. You can still do that here for Codeception because Codeception is still built on PHP unit. Right? So why I prefer to do it this way is basically because it, it's a, it, it groups together more logically. Right? So I'm testing, I'm testing one, one validation there and then it's just after that all these different tests, instead of putting it into different, different uh, functions, I'll just put it into these different uh, specify uh, function calls because technically speaking, it's it's still you're still testing the same thing, just different scenarios. Provider basically just is an array, right? Pardon? Provider is an array mm -hmm. that 
it will just keep on running your same test function. So let's say as example now I test validation. Mm -hmm. Then I have two input parameters. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is the uh, input and expected result. Then provider is just an array of these two elements. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can lah. This is just an example. So, uh, that is a very like personal opinion way to do it, right? Uh, you you can do it that way too. Uh, I I actually would probably mix it a bit, mix it mix it a bit. Uh, just because I like this format. Again, this is my personal opinion on on how to test. So providers are are useful, right? But you and you can still specify it inside this probably i haven't tried it yet because like i said i only discovered this quite recently uh, but it's a very opinion related thing so you can use it i'm just pointing out that this is a very very uh spec style of testing that i like uh, the thing is uh, yeah you, we can make the, the same thing with the php init and the provider <coughs> uh, annotation uh, but uh, the php init is so stable you know because I have, I have uh, during two last year, I, I mm -hmm. have many issues with uh, conception because the uh, version of conception. Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, that, that is actually one, one of my, two, many, two. my pet peeves. Uh. So, uh, especially with Laravel, right? Yeah. Especially with Laravel, uh, you have to be careful with versions when you include conception into your projects. Right? So, Technically speaking, if you find that one version of Codeception works with one version of Laravel, you have to you I, it's it's recommended you lock that version in your composer.json file because there's there's always been this compatibility issue with Codeception and Laravel. Because it's a new uh, new framework, Codeception. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but so far with like if you don't use uh, Laravel. Uh, actually, Laravel or Symfony, so far that I've seen this issue. Zen, I don't use Zen that much, so I can't really comment on that. Uh, I haven't encountered this issue with Slim. So, so far, Slim is fine, but that's probably because most of my Slim packages is, I specify myself, it's not part of default Slim. I don't know, but uh, the package provides uh, my for this for what? Because mm. I work with a uh, web driver. Uh, mm. Yeah, with, with Laravel. No, no. Is it the Laravel module or? Yeah, uh, I, I use web driver module uh, ah. to, uh, to test in the uh, front end. Right. Yeah, it's it's it, of, of, uh, the update of it is. I usually, I like I said, I I lock that version, the version number in once I'm done because. Technically speaking, also when I do a project, uh, I tend not to update the, the package. At least not major version updates. And when I do, yeah, Codeception has been a headache in terms of that. But I feel that the all the being able to include uh, acceptance tests into your automated test suite is uh, really valuable. Because uh, I think main reason is just I'm, I just don't want to have to go through the click, 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 and yeah, yeah, it's working. Right, it, it's, 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 I, mean, I guess I'm too lazy for that. <laughs> with, with Jenkins, uh, yeah, exactly. With, with Jenkins, you can run it automatically also, uh, or with, with, with uh, I'm not sure about Travis CI, but Circle CI, you can do it also. With, yeah. and then, so, uh, another useful uh, extra module for conception, which I like, is uh, SPEC mock. So, any of you familiar with like uh, mocking frameworks for classes, mocking for classes? Like mockery, you use... use uh, just, uh, the PHP unit uh, mocking classes, is it? Uh, so, the most popular is actually uh, mockery. Uh, be, uh, mainly also because I think it works really well with Laravel. Laravel is really popular. And the uh, Laravel facades... Uh, Mocking is pretty much based on mockery anyway, but they don't use mockery for some reason. I don't know. They should, I think. Hey, that's that's a different that's a different discussion for a different time. Right. So, but uh, one of the problems with a lot of the standard uh, mocking frameworks now that is you can't mock static uh, static function calls. You can't mock static classes. So, but aspect mock can do that. 
And then I find this especially valuable if you're... Uh, why I started to love this basically is because I took over a, an old Laravel project which uh, had a lot of like uh, people who misunderstand facades working on it. So I end up having a lot of static uh, classes with a lot of static functions. Basically classes with just static functions. And that's really annoying to, to test. So thankfully at that time I discovered aspect mock. Okay. So aspect mock uses uh, this Go AOP library to work. So what it basically does is uh, I'm amazed they can do they can they manage to make it work so fast when they do this is it will go through your your source code and it will it would wrap all your source code uh, in like an object wrapper of its own. Right. And then when you call that function, right, it will check with your specific specify uh, your your code for the aspect mock. And if you specify a replacement or a different functionality, it would replace, in, inject that functionality into your source code when you call it at runtime, right? And I'm still amazed how they managed to make it work so fast because I have no idea, right? But the good thing is that you can pretty much mock static classes, which is something that we've I've never been able to do before as mock, right? So the keyword part here is this. Test uh, double. So test is basically you will want to you want to use like a use uh, aspect mock as test, which is the most useful way to because you don't want to type aspect mock all the time. It's damn long, right? So you create the uh, mock double of the user model. So what this does, it will take the the source code of the entire user model class, wraps it in this ob object uh, wrapper, and then it sees that next argument, which is uh, table name my users right so what it will do is basically it would replace uh, in runtime it would replace all instances of the value for table name with my users at runtime so if you do like a user model table name see that's a that's a static function call right and you can still box static function calls right so now like really the only thing should if they can do like if we can mock private uh, private functions are uh, they'll be like oh, <laughs> but if you can mock private functions, then I think there's a a bit of a security loophole there. <laughs> but it, it can be useful. So uh, this is another code exception uh, add-on. I would say it's actually, you can actually use it separately, but it's made by the same people that created code exception, and it's really useful, especially if you have legacy code that has a lot of uh, a lot of calls to static. Uh, methods useful useful yeah and uh, that's about all for my presentation so anybody have any questions no anybody have any comments I suck my explanations are bad uh, yeah how much of the time you spend in testing as compared to development in testing alright so this is, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a danger zone, right? So if you're like me, uh, and you really, like, you really like reading into new tech and new code, like, you know, follow down the rabbit hole kind of thing, uh, it can get dangerous when you discover new things like this. So uh, I actually spent a lot of time just reading up on new things, what I can do with, what I can do with aspect model, what I can do with conception, then I actually did coding at first, right? But once I figured it out and managed to do, uh, I do spend more time writing actual code than tests. But you have to, uh, you have to remember that the, downs, the upside is that you also spend less time writing, uh, fixing bugs. Right? So ultimately, you will probably overall spend more time, just generally speaking. But less of that time will be on fixing bugs. And then in the long term, especially if we're talking about like past the initial phase of a new project, you you do have this certain level of confidence that your code works because of all the this tests. And then you can also have a certain level of confidence that you know all these previous bugs that you've discovered previously won't probably won't show up again. And if they do, you'll catch it immediately in your test. Right? So the key thing here that I would take away to prevent all this is automation. Uh, automate your tests 
running it's running automate your your deployment and all this so like uh, for example like most of my projects nowadays i use circle ci i'm not sure if you're familiar with circle ci so basically circle ci will look at my repository on github uh, every commit to master or development branch it will take my code and run code sap run or whatever testing framework i do and then it will run the test and then if, if the test fails i immediately get an email saying hey your test fails fix it Right, so that's a very good idea to, to do it. So even if you you miss out on just running the, the test after you complete the code before you commit your code, right? You forgot to run the full test suite. Circle CI or Travis CI will do it for you, and it will immediately notify you if if you want to that your test has failed. You want to go like one step further. I know there are some companies out there that has like big, like big screen, 50 inch screens TV with like little things there, and like it's all green. And then the moment one thing goes red, and somebody shouts, "Hey, your test failed!" There's there's companies that does that, and it's actually a really good idea if you're if you're willing to invest the kind of money to that because you will immediately know if a test failed, and you will immediately know to fix it. Yeah. So that means usually you they automate deployment also. And if the test fails, then it won't get deployed. That means it won't get out to like to your users. I hope that answers your question because I can't remember your. It just, it just yeah, it is in, initially it will be very very hard because you have to like uh, get into that flow of things. But once you once you get used to it, you you will slowly build up because it's a different way of thinking and that takes effort. But once you're used to it, right? It the uh, you kind of get used to it, lah. You will you go along smoother. I mean, you will still take more time writing writing new features and things like that because you, it it is extra work. But the benefits in the long run is is much better. It's it's like familiarizing yourself with any new tool, right? It's going to take some time to practice. It's a learning curve. It's a slight learning curve. But once you you're familiar with, with the way of doing things, way of doing things in that little framework or that testing framework, you you come you come naturally to yeah. Any other questions? Hmm. Right. So. Thank you. Thank you.